Academic writing and argumentation is a difficult art to master. I will start explaining why by showing you some really bad examples of academic writing, which I intended to shock you, maybe also to entertain you a bit, but mainly to warn you to be on your guard the day you will work as an academic writer yourself. I will also introduce you to the standard IMRAD style by which most original research papers are written and submitted to scientific journals. IMRAD stands for Introduction, Methods, Results and Discussion. In the second part of this video lecture, I will take you on a small journey through the history of argumentation theory and try to explain how different understandings of the purpose of an argument dictate the writing styles out there. For instance, is an argument in essence an act of persuasion or is it a logical exercise to find the truth? Maybe it's a quarrel, a heated discussion, or is an argument a tool for compromise? Different theories lead to different styles. Finally, in the third part, I will discuss the large spectrum of audiences interested in science and the many formats and styles used for these audiences. I will try to show that it's really important for you as a writer to know who your re reader is and you should be very conscious about the styles formats and techniques you want to use. In my previous video lecture on the basics of news writing, I said it was important as a writer to get out of the way and let the facts speak for themselves. In academic writing, it's more complicated. Yes, on the surface of it, academic writing seems impersonal, dry, fact-oriented. But if you look a bit closer, things become ambiguous. The reason is, first of all, that facts need interpretations and interpretations come with a point of view. Therefore, authors of academic texts will always have to argue for the facts beyond what simple empirical evidence and logic can provide. They have to justify their claims and they have to compete with other points of view. So, behind a faceless and objective facade, academic writing is among the most personal forms of writing out there. Another reason for the ambiguity of academic writing is hidden in the fact that academics under normal circumstances write for a very small audience. Research papers are intended for a small group of experts sharing the same interests and beliefs. These experts generally know each other very well, but they are also very critical towards each other. Such academic expert groups are called discourse communities and the competition is immense. So, as an academic writer, you try to convince your discourse community of your ideas by formulating a series of strong arguments, which hopefully will be accepted by the group. In that sense, the dry and seemingly unbiased style of academic writing is a highly codified form of self-preservation. In quite many academic communities, these self-presenting discursive codes have become so agonizingly self-conscious and over-stylized that they look like complete nonsense to the outsiders. Take a look at this recently published paragraph from a book by a German literary critic Barbara Winken discussing the writings of Gustave Flaubert. She probably has a point, but for us it's complete gobbledygook, an endless gibberish of obscure, pretentious and technical words designed to impress somebody and keep the rest of us out of the loop. Let's be fair and look at a recently discussed example from the hard sciences, where similar problems can emerge. A systems theory professor called George Mobus from the University of Washington, Tacoma, presents a new language on his blog. When you read this, you immediately know that you are lost. But even if you knew quite a few things about system theory and computer modeling, your bullshit alarm would still go off because the text is full of unwarranted claims and opaque uses of codified words producing everything but clarity. A few years ago, the linguist and popular science writer Steven Pinker wrote an article called Why Academics Stink at Writing for the Chronicle of Higher Education, in which he described academic writing as being turgid, 
soggy, wooden, bloated, clumsy, obscure, unpleasant to read and impossible to understand. He is not the only one to complain. Complaints have been plenty during the last 50 years or so, but things have, have probably just become worse. And again, the reason for this state of affairs is an extreme and increasing academic specialization and competition. Universities today are a huge collection of niche communities which have developed their own linguistic inventions, their own implicit rules of needlessly complex sentences and an endless battery of professional jargon. Just as birds in the jungle have to show off their colorful displays and the most crazy songs to attract mates, academics today have to impress their peers to get tenure. That's the nature of the academic writing game. Okay. Of course, academic writing is not only the art of decoration and display. In its core, academic writing should be the art of building good arguments in an ongoing discussion with others about the true state of the world. You could even say in its core, academic writing is the proper articulation of the scientific method. And the scientific method, if we accept that such a thing exists, is a certain way of asking questions, creating hypotheses, observing, experimenting, testing, reasoning and so on. There are formal rules to building such arguments and organizing them in scientific papers. Those rules go under the acronym IMRAD, which stands for Introduction, Methods, Results and Discussion. The IMRAD template began to be used around the 1930s or 40s and within a period of about 50 years it has become the de facto standard for organizing original research papers. In this hourglass model on my right, the four main sections of the IMRAD template are ordered top-down. The wider the element is drawn, the more general your perspective will be. Which is natural, because in the introduction you will have to drag the reader into the research questions you want to investigate and in the discussion you will try to contextualize your results and think about further developments. So. The introduction explains the research questions and hypotheses you want to investigate in the context of previous scientific studies about the same or similar questions. Naturally then, the introduction contains a lot of references to relevant documents in the existing literature. Empirical techniques and methods for analyzing them are laid out in the section called Materials and Methods, or just Methods. Here the data collection, materials and methods by which you have obtained your findings should be explained in adequate detail so that subsequent scientists with appropriate knowledge and experience should be able to repeat your observations. The results are normally presented with the aid of graphs, images, tables or other statistical tools and they have to be properly explained in the captions as well as in the main text. The section called a discussion or conclusion contains the interpretations and limitations of the results and discusses them in the light of existing knowledge. Your conclusions will have to be based on the evidence just obtained, backed by logic and reason. But there's ample room for you and your rhetorical skills to point the reader to what you think yourself about the implications of your work as well as to possible consequences and to further research to be done in the future.